So the first uh, discussion in this session is from Ken Gewant from Global Foundries, and his title of his talk is a 300 millimeter silicon photonics foundry. Ken's currently a fellow at Global Foundries, and of course he's working on silicon photonic technology development. He's been working on that since 2015, where his focus has been bringing up a 300 millimeter facility uh, for silicon photonics. Uh, before that, he was working on high-performance CBOS technology for high-end servers and ASIC applications from 130 to down to 22 nanometer nodes. And, uh, and this has one of been, been one of Ken's most exciting assignments here, is bringing, bringing a silicon photonics foundry to light. So, Ken? Okay, thank you, Rich. Thanks. Okay, thanks. This works. <clears throat> How's that sound? Good? Okay. <clears throat> I want to start off by thanking AIM for giving uh, Global Foundries the opportunity to, to come and share um, our, our silicon photonics uh, status. Uh, Ted Latavik does apologize for not being here today. He's uh, recovering from, from surgery, so I will take you through the status. Um, so, uh, what I want to do today is uh, I'll talk a little bit about our, the status of our 90 nanometer technology platform. That's, that's our most mature. I'll, I'll show you some headlights uh, to our next uh, platform on 45 nanometer. And, and then I'll, I'll spend some time showing you some data from 300 millimeter. And we're really kind of taking you through the, the value add of coming to 300 millimeter and trying to leverage advanced patterning and, and advanced controls. I'll show a few examples. Uh, certainly can't take you through the full library, but I'll, I'll show you some distributions. We have uh, been investing a lot in uh, growing our test infrastructure, so we're able to get more statistical data for process control and learning. So I think that's really, really key to, to drive this uh, industry forward. Uh, then I'll spend a little bit of time on our, on our first level optical fiber attach. In our, uh, our platform, we use uh, passive eGroove technology. So we'll, we'll be using that both in 90 and 45. So I'll be showing some results there. And then finally, I'll just touch on our, our uh, test capability, what we have currently, and, and some of our plans to advance in the future. Uh, so just this is this is kind of a night chart, but um, uh, we, we started on, on a 200 millimeter platform uh, up in up in Burlington, Vermont, uh, 90 nanometer. It was a uh, all of our all of our technology platforms are are monolithic, and so we will continue to integrate both the CMOS with the with the photonics. I know that's a big debate in the in industry: do you go monolithic? Do you go hybrid? Uh, we are staying on the monolithic path because we see we definitely see a path up to 45 nanometer. Uh, in, in 200 millimeter, uh, we we are currently in early production and we have transferred this this technology to 300 millimeter. Uh, we we're, we're qualifying the base technology. It's based. Uh, we're using Moxender traveling wave modulators. Uh, the photo detector Jubanium is currently an RMG, which is a rapid rapid melt growth growth process that integrates well with the CMOS uh, thermal anneals. And then, you know, I'm not going to take you through all of the, all the elements, I'll show you some examples, but we are uh, fully integrating a 90 nanometer uh, CMOS technology on, on our product, uh, up to 3 volts I.O. And we have a full, fully enabled backend and a fully enabled uh, EO uh, PDK. So then moving to 300 millimeter, we are uh, bringing on more, more elements, uh, optimizing for 25 gig, gigapod. Uh, we, we have introduced uh, CWDM, uh, MUX DMUX into the, into the PDK, and we are uh, continuing to do development on germanium epi photodiode to get uh, enhanced bandwidth on epi. It's currently not part of 90, but that is uh, planned to be uh, in 45 and potentially that qualified on 90. And then moving, uh, moving forward to phase three, uh, 45 nanometer, we will leverage all the learning on the photonics elements we've done here. We'll keep our, our SOI T silicon the same, so we can leverage all the learning and that'll port to 45. The big difference here is that we'll be bringing in our 45 SOI RF uh, CMOS technology. We'll be using a dual T silicon, so we have to keep uh, one silicon thickness for our CMOS and one silicon thickness for the photonics all still on a two micron box. Uh, we'll, we will be bringing in germanium epi photodiode and potentially avalanche. Um, we're also going to introduce a silicon nitride waveguide for uh, uh, 
different coupling options and also AWG, much the much, so possibly a thermal uh, uh, solutions for, for MUX. And then uh, potentially in the future, uh, 2.5 DNTSV options. Uh, some of you may have seen this before, but uh, basically it's just a demonstration of everything that we're integrating today on a, on a PIC. Uh, this is a, one of the early products. The, all the red is uh, digital logic controls, drivers. Uh, that the blue is RF, uh, RF CMOS, in, in all the photonics is down here. Uh, they have our passive uh, V-Groove uh, fiber alignment, TIE, TIEs, drivers, uh, MOX zenders, uh, again, all fully integrated on one, on one pick. And so uh, you know, this, this is in early production now. Okay, so what I'll, what I'll take you through uh, now is just try to show you the advantage of, you know, why go to 300 millimeter? Uh, well, well, one, we have uh, the immersion lithography uh, in Fab 10 down at Fishco Global Foundries. We want to leverage this for photonics. Uh, you know, we are, we are uh, bringing this up at the, at the RX level, which is where all your waveguides are, are, are made. We've developed an optimized and OPC patterning uh, for this technology, so we're able to, you know, fully optimize all the, all the uh, line and CD critical structure for a CMOS in, in the photonics. And just in comparison, if you compare dry lithography to immersion, you can, you can see almost a 3x improvement and not just the, the, the CD sigma, but also the line edge roughness. And we believe it's a combination of this, which is gonna give us much better uh, control and much better loss. And I'll show you some data. And this is just an example of some of the fidelity that you get with immersion versus uh, dry, dry lithography. So I think if you a few charts, uh, this is comparing our, our 200 millimeter facility, which is using dry immersion lithography. This is a just a standard uh, 350 single mode waveguide in silicon. And you can see the improved distribution uh, that you can achieve with the, with the lithography. Almost a, almost a full dB improvement in loss in, in a tighter distribution. <coughs> this is the KG waveguide. This isn't a library element, but it's used for the for the mox enders for the modulators. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, we're, we're bringing the loss down almost, almost a dB compared to 200. This is an example of the uh, junction phase shifter. Uh, here we're, we're about, actually we're slightly higher than 200 millimeter. We have a nice normal distribution. Uh, we're still in the process of uh, optimizing our implants, you know, to balance the, the MOX under for extinction ratio and loss and, and performance, AC performance, but we, we do believe what will drive us down a little bit, but it's, like I said, it's a trade-off between DC and AC performance. And it's an example of a wavelength independent uh, coupler, insertion loss, uh, you know, very low. And actually, this was also lower compared to 200 millimeter. So again, I'm not gonna take you through, through all the elements. I think this is the last one, the thermal phase shifter uh, we have our, our power pi, is about, about uh, 38 watts per pi, pi phase shift, and we're seeing insertion loss about the 2.8 dB for the thermal phase shifter. So again, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty decent performance. And, and, and the, the thing is too, now we're getting, we're starting to see now a lot of data because now we have automation with our iLots testers. We're able to test uh, one way for 30 macros, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours. So now I think that the real power here is that we have the improved controls from 300 millimeter, but now we also are collecting a lot of the statistics. So now we're able to see things that we couldn't see before. So, you know, yeah, you have a nice normal distribution. Now we can start to feel the onion go for wafer to wafer, lot to lot across wafer variability and start to do more advanced data mining. So we really believe once we, once we get this established, we can continue to, to push and optimize for designs too. Okay, this might be a little hard to see, it is. Uh, but this is, uh, we're also, I, I mentioned we're, we're introducing uh, MUX DMUX into our, into our PDK. Uh, this is our go-to design now. We have, this is a simulation is based on hardware influence models, okay? So it's not just a simulation, it is based on bringing in the hardware from all the different components, the WIC, the thermal tuners. It is not a, a thermal design, it, it does need thermal tuning. 
Uh, the, the DMUX itself needs about 21 thermal tuners. The MUX needs seven. It's a large number. Uh, but that, that this tuning is needed to center the grid because when you, when you put this together, you're going to always have process variability. So your grid is not going to be centered on the O-band. So there will be some tuning involved. I'll take you through some, some numbers of what we think it'll take to tune it. But uh, the type of numbers we're seeing, we're projecting are about you know, two, two and a half dB of, uh, insertion loss about 25, minus 25 dB crosstalk. We're seeing about a, about a 14 uh, flat top, uh, 14 nanometer uh, flat top across one dB roll off. Again, this is all for the, for the O-band. Um, this is a table showing, it's, it's a complicated table, but basically there's, there's a lot of different uh, variations. Uh, this is a cascaded multiplexer, so it's just a, it's a cascaded filter. Uh, whether you use one stage, two stage, or a combination of two and three stage, you can you can change the type of response you get from a, a partial flat top to a full flat top. Uh, you know, so just as as an example, if you look at the the three stage wide flat top uh, multiplexer, uh, we have uh, seven MZIs that need seven tuners. Uh, we are moving these tuners to what we're calling an isolated or undercut tuner. If we use the standard tuners, or we use silicide to, to do the thermal tuning, uh, the powers are unacceptable. What we're finding is if we go to these undercut or thermally isolated tuners, we can, we can cut the power down by almost uh, seven. So we are, we are targeting these undercut thermal tuners. Uh, for the DMUX, like I said, it's about 21 tuners. Uh, and we're getting average powers if you add these two up anywhere from uh, 240 down to 125 milliwatts for average power to do the tuning. So just in summary, uh, you know, what I, what I showed you, I certainly didn't go through the full library, but we're clearly seeing improved performance going to 300 millimeter. Uh, in several components, we're, we're seeing, you know, half to a dB on several components. And so what we're thinking for a, for a standard pick, we can almost save two to three dB going to 300 millimeter on a, on a, on a uh, pick design. And because we are getting more uh, statistics, uh, better distributions, we'll be able to see a lot more things. So we'll continue to study the distribution uh, going forward. Okay, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on our, on our photodiode. In, um, in, in 90WG, our base technology, we, we're using today an RMG photodiode. It's, there's a seed window here, and during the CMOS source strain anneal, uh, you, you start with amorphous germanium, you, you pattern it, and when you go through the source strain anneal, it crystallizes at this window, and when it cools, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll, you'll grow a crystal at the end. This is the waveguide coming in, so you get all your activity happening up here. And so we've, we've been optimizing the layout, the dimensions of this over, over the years, working with our development partners. We've uh, gotten some pretty decent results, uh, you know, through combinations of design and process optimization. Uh, we are also, and I'll show you some data of this on this diode, and we're also looking, doing a lot of learning using EPI, so instead of doing the, the rapid uh, growth remelt, most people have been doing EPI. We also have the capability in 300 millimeter, and I'll show you some results here as well. We're getting also very encouraging results. Uh, actually, we're getting results where we can still uh, monolithically integrate this with 90 nanometer. That was one, one challenge because of the thermal uh, processes that come with this, but we are seeing the path to continue to keep this in a, in a monolithic platform. Just some results on the RMG process. Uh, this is the bandwidth on the x-axis, and this is, these are some implant conditions down here in the, in the uh, NMP side. It's, it's a PIN diode. Uh, just different design layouts, and you can see we're able to achieve anywhere from 25 to 38 uh, gigahertz. And we have responsivities upwards of 0.75. Uh, dark current is never going to be at, as good as EPI. You know, these, these dark current numbers are 500, 600 nanoamps. Uh, that, that, is, that is high for uh, some applications, like monolithic, uh, that it's, 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 it's fine. Uh, and, and again, the, the trade-offs here between bandwidth, uh, you, you typically trade off bandwidth and responsivity. 
but for a 10 gig, 25 gig operation, uh, that we, these numbers uh, are suitable. And we got some uh, recent results on our EPI process. We're, we're pushing up to 40 gigahertz. Um, actually, the instrumentation was only calibrated up to 40, so we believe these numbers will go beyond 40. And we're getting very, uh, very good responsivity numbers up over one amp per watt and, and off currents uh, down 100. I think these are numbers for certain applications. You know, this might be more suitable. And, and we, like I said, we do believe we could integrate this with with our monolithic platform. We're getting our, our thermal processes down uh, below 700. And then uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on on fiber attach. Um, this is this is a uh, again probably a big debate in the industry. You know, do you do passive fiber alignment? Do you do active uh, butt coupling? Do you do top top grading from the top or grading couplers from the bottom? You know, we are uh, holding the course and we are going to leverage this uh, this V groove technology. Uh, we, we we formed a V groove using a combination of, of rye through our back end stack, and then we do uh, TMAH to get the crystallographic etch. Uh, so uh, this, if you do this right and get the right dimensions, you'll, you'll center your core, your 8 micron core on the waveguide. And uh, this is a cross-sectional view and then a top-down view. We're basically taking the fiber going through a undercut metamaterial. And so it's, it's, a, it's basically a mode converter to take your mode from 8 microns down to a single uh, you know, 350 micron mode uh, over the course of uh, several hundred microns. And uh, this is where the 300 millimeter lithography really comes into play because all these dimensions are very critical. You know, the size of the spine, the rib, and all these these uh, these posts are really critical. And uh, you know, we are achieving loss now on the order of uh, on, on short loops, one and a half dB per per fiber and two and a half per fluid. There's just some results. Uh, this is the loss per uh, per V-groove per fiber. Uh, this is uh, some, we call them super short loops, but basically it shows the ultimate capability of the spot converter. So we're getting losses on the order of one and a half dB. And then, uh, and, and this is a, a DOE site that, it, that we use, like a 12 fiber. We, we build the V-grooves of different sizes so we can calibrate the right size of the V-groove. And, um, this is integrated data. We're getting, we're achieving about two and a half, uh, two and a half DB. And these are some uh, optical return loss uh, numbers. Uh, basically, we are we are seeing optical return loss uh, in, on the order of you know, thirty-five to forty DB. So that, that's a very, uh, very competitive number. And then finally. Uh, uh, people are concerned about uh, when you when you do a V groove, uh, you, you have to cut all your back end stack. You have to cut all your passivation. You know, so now you're bringing to bring light in. You have to open your chip to environmental elements, and so it's important that you uh, take your your V groove structures to high temperature, uh, stress, and, and humidity. And uh, we've developed a, a moisture barrier process now that as we, we've gone up to a thousand hours. We are seeing uh, this is the O band, good good response, good flat response across the O band, and we're seeing uh, you know very good uh, stability after a thousand hours of uh, high temperature, stress, and humidity, 85 degrees. Some of the delta here is more more likely due to uh, you got to take your fibers on and off the tester. When you when you get a moisture fail, what will happen is your response will, will be very strongly dependent of, on wavelength. These measurements here are in dry, dry air, and there's two fibers, uh, two I think two two fibers per stress uh, test site. That's why the numbers are higher than uh, what you uh, reported earlier. <coughs> and then uh, finally, this is my last page. I think I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about our test capability. Uh, all of our technology verification is done more on a bench tester. Uh, we do. Uh, we're, we're bringing on new equipment to get to 25 and 50 gigabits per second or gigabod. Uh, the, the workhorse, the data I showed you was from our inline testers. We call them ILOTs, inline optical tests. We have uh, four systems now, uh, four in Burlington. We're going to start to bring these down to 300 millimeter in Fishkill. Um, but this is where most of the data that I showed you today came from. Basically, it's a 25 pin electrical, uh, two optical fibers. 
and the alignment of the fibers is done, it's about, it's in seconds, you know, half to two seconds to align a fiber. And then to test 30 macros takes about, <coughs> about 10 minutes, times about 15 sites. And so we're still working on a wafer acceptance criteria, but uh, you know, so far we're, we're, we're getting really good throughput and better, better data and better controls. And then the other systems, we also have uh, four systems for wafer product tests. Uh, and then uh, next year we'll start. We'll be bringing on more more equipment uh, for the higher higher buy rates and also uh, possibly module module or package test. So in, in summary, um, you know our 300 millimeter roadmap. We will continue to uh, push the monolithic uh, roadmap. Uh, when I say monolithic, if somebody wants a hybrid application, you can certainly build in hybrid. You don't need the CMOS. We can we can take those block level implants out. Find it's not a real big cost uh, savings to do that, but it's certainly an option. Uh, I showed you going to 300 millimeter, we have uh, demonstrated improved loss uh, up to about 2 to 3 dB uh, relative to the, to the older imaging technology. And we have germanium uh, photodiodes now pushing 40, 40 gigahertz uh, with the epi process and up to 1 inch per watt, uh, targeting the 50, 56, 64 gigawatt applications. Uh, we'll continue to optimize our V-group, but right now we're achieving uh, two and a half dB uh, per, per fiber uh, with, uh, with competitive return loss and in good uh, moisture barrier stress. I didn't talk much about the PDK, but we, we do have a fully enabled PDK for both electrical and optical, so it's a, it's a co-design co, uh, environment, uh, full, full models, full, full uh, path tools for photonics and electrical tests. And I uh, showed you our, our test capability. So I think that's it. How are you doing, time, Rich? Okay. I also want to. I also want to acknowledge the uh, teams in Burlington and Fishkill, the process integration team, to packaging and the test teams. And, 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 and. So just wanted to give a shout out. Yep. A couple of questions, Amy. Uh, can you talk about the light source? Okay, the light uh, source in, in for mo most of your designs is the light coming in through the fiber. Do you have other schemes for coupling so lasers? So right right now, all of our light sources coming in through the fiber O band. Um, we are looking at uh, other options. You know, potentially you know bring you know mount mount a laser on a chip. That's certainly it's not part of the kit today. Right now, all it all comes in through the fiber. So right now, uh, the the PDK is generally available for O band, uh, targeting uh, data center applications, uh, CIPRI. Uh, we have demonstrated C band uh, applications and, and designs. That's generally not available. But certainly, the O band is available now. Uh, the 90 nanometer <coughs> platform will be fully qualified probably first quarter next year. And we're starting the, the 45 nanometer development cycle now. Yeah, you mentioned the CWDM has uh, phase shifters. Yep. Are those set once they forget, or are they actively tuned no. throughout? <clears throat> what I think we're still in the process of developing a test protocol. It's going to be complicated because you got you know 21 tuner. You're not going to have these tuners running full tilt all the time. But they'll they'll be for each chip. The vision is you have a lookup table. You do it at two temperatures: temperature one, temperature two. And then that test table stay, stays with that chip. And so when you go into the field, you put the tuners at these, at these settings to recenter your grid. And that goes with the chip. You put it in EFUs, you put it in some class or something. So that, that's the vision. And we will uh, be building a module to demonstrate that later, later in the year, early next year. Forty-five, forty-five nanometers should be able to handle that. Forty-five RF. If we can maintain the, the performance of the CMOS, we, we should be able to easily get to 56, 64 gigabaud. Uh, some of the FTF maxes are very. If you're familiar with the forty-five RF technology, but it's it's a, it's a high performance. So um, beyond that, 
uh, we'll, we'll have to see. We, we are looking into uh, taking this learning and potentially integrating uh, advanced nodes in the future. A, a, a laser driver up to uh, right now it's a uh, one point uh, for 1.8 is our is our CMOS technology right now. Well, you could drive your MOX Ender at 1.8. Yeah. If they have to drive it higher than that, then you'd have to take bring the source off chip. Yeah, and and it's not out of the question to add a three volt device either. We do have three volt. We're starting with 1.8. If you have to drive three, that's something that we could add in the future too. It really depends on the performance of the modulator. Just one more question. Yes. You mentioned that you support both hybrid and monolithic solutions. Can, can you comment briefly on uh, how you support hybrid solutions? So a hybrid solution would, um, of course, the customer would have to bring the TIA and driver off chip, right? So you know, we, we could offer the pick, we'd offer the, the fiber attach, and we would just skip the CMOS implants. There's probably 16 implants that we would throw out. About using interposers or flip chip or anything like that. Well, there's all there's there's plenty of there's packaging options, right? It could be wire bond. Uh, we are developing uh, C4 flip chip compatibility with with the fiber attach that's in development. But if we if we offer a hybrid solution, we would sell the wafer, potentially attach fibers, and the customer would have to. Solution to the package. Thanks, Sam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.